Just about two weeks ago, on November 1st, British Deputy Prime Minister Geoffrey Howe resigned his post in the Thatcher cabinet. In his resignation notice, Mr. Howe expressed concern that Prime Minister Thatcher was reluctant to commit to the economic and political union of Europe. And he said that reluctance could isolate Great Britain in the European community. Howe was the last remaining member of Thatcher's original cabinet and served with her since 1979, first as Chancellor of the Exchequer and then as Foreign Secretary. He was appointed Deputy Prime Minister last year. A number of polls in Great Britain show the Prime Minister's support fading in light of the Howe resignation and economic questions. Wednesday, Conservative Member of Parliament Michael Heseltine announced that he would challenge Mrs. Thatcher for leadership of the party when the Conservatives caucus next Tuesday. If successful, Mr. Heseltine would become Prime Minister. Up next, from London, England, it's a speech made Tuesday to the British House of Commons by Sir Geoffrey Howe, in which he talks about why he resigned from the Thatcher cabinet. Order. 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 I remind the House that a resignation statement is heard in silence and without interruption. Sir Geoffrey Howe. Mr. Speaker, sir, I find to my astonishment that a quarter of a century has passed since I last spoke from one of these back benches. Fortunately, however, it's been my privilege to serve for the last 12 months of that time as leader of this House of Commons. So I've been reminded quite recently of the traditional generosity and tolerance of this place. I hope that I may count on that today as I offer to the House a statement about my resignation from the government. It's been suggested, even indeed by some of my right honourable friends, that I decided to resign solely because of questions of style and not on matters of substance at all. Indeed, if some of my former colleagues are to be believed, I must be the first minister in history who have resigned because he was in full agreement with government policy. <laughs> The truth, the truth is, Mr. Speaker, that in many aspects of politics, style and substance complement each other. Very often they're two sides of the same coin. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and I have shared together something like 700 meetings of Cabinet or Shadow Cabinet over the last 18 years. Some, some 400 hours alongside each other at more than 30 international summit meetings. For both of us, I suspect, that's a pretty daunting record. The House might well feel that something more than simple matters of style would be necessary to rupture such a well-tried relationship. It was indeed a privilege to serve as my right honourable friend's first Chancellor of the Exchequer, to share in the transformation of our industrial relations scene, to help launch our free market programme commencing with the abolition of exchange control, and above all, to achieve such substantial success against inflation, getting it down within four years from 22 to 4% upon the basis of the strict monetary discipline involved in the medium-term financial strategy. Not one of our economic achievements would have been possible without the courage and the leadership of my right honourable friend. And if I may say so, Mr Speaker, they possibly derived some little benefit from the presence of a Chancellor who wasn't exactly a wet himself. It was to a great honour to serve for six years as Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary and to share with my right honourable friend in some, in some notable achievements in the European community from Fontainebleau to the Single European Act. But it was as we moved on to consider the crucial monetary issues in a European context, that I've come to feel increasing concern. Some of the reasons for this anxiety were made very clear by my right honourable friend, the member for Blaby, in his resignation speech just over 12 months ago. For like him, I concluded at least five years back that the conduct of our policy against inflation could no longer rest solely 
on attempts to measure and control the domestic money supply. We had no doubt that we should be helped in that battle, and indeed in other respects, by joining the exchange rate mechanism of the European monetary system. There was or should have been nothing novel about joining the ERM. It's been a long-standing commitment, and we'd found for a quarter of a century after the Second World War that the very similar Bretton Woods regime did serve as a useful discipline. And now, as my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has acknowledged two weeks ago, our entry into the exchange rate mechanism can indeed be seen as an extra discipline for keeping down inflation. But it must be said that this important practical conclusion has only been achieved at the cost of substantial damage to her own administration and more serious still to its inflation achievement. For as my right honourable friend, the member for Blaby, has explained, the real tragedy is that we did not join the exchange rate mechanism at least five years ago. That was, as he also made clear, not for want of trying. Indeed, the so-called Madrid conditions came into existence only after the then Chancellor of the Exchequer and myself as Foreign Secretary made it clear that we could not continue in office unless a specific commitment to join the exchange rate mechanism was made. As the House will no doubt have observed, neither member of that particular partnership now remains in office. Our successor as Chancellor of the Exchequer has, during the last year, had to devote a good deal of his considerable talent to demonstrating exactly how those Madrid conditions have been attained, <laughs> so as to make it... <laughs> so as to make it possible to fulfil to fulfil a commitment whose achievement has long been in the national interest. It is now, alas, impossible to resist the conclusion that today's higher rates of inflation could well have been avoided had the question of ERM membership been properly considered and resolved at a much earlier stage. There are, I fear, developing grounds for similar anxiety over the handling, not just at and after the Rome summit, of the wider, much more open question of economic and monetary union. Let me first make clear certain important points on which I have no disagreement with my right honourable friends. I do not regard the Delors report as some kind of sacred text that has to be accepted or even rejected on the nod. But it is an important working document. As I've often made plain, it is seriously deficient in significant respects. I do not regard the Italian presidency's management of the Rome summit as a model of its kind. <laughs> far, far from it. It was much the same as my right honourable friend the Prime Minister will recall in Milan some five years, before, five years ago. I do not regard it as in any sense wrong for Britain to make criticisms of that kind, plainly and courteously, nor in any sense wrong for us to do so, if necessary, alone. As I've already made clear, I have, like the Prime Minister and other right honourable friends, fought too many European battles in a minority of one to have any illusions on that score. But it is crucially important that we should conduct those arguments upon the basis of a clear understanding of the true relationship between this country, the community, and our community partners. And it is here I fear that my right honourable friend increasingly risks leading herself and others astray in matters of substance as well as of style. It was the late Lord Stockton, formerly Harold Macmillan, who first put the central point clearly. As long ago as 1962, he argued that we had to place and keep ourselves <coughs> within the European community. He saw it as essential then, as it is today, not to cut ourselves off from the realities of power, not to retreat into a ghetto of sentimentality about our past, and so diminish our own control over our own destiny in the future. The pity is that the Macmillan view had not been perceived more clearly a decade before, in the 1950s. <laughs> It would have spared us so many of the struggles of the last 20 years had we been in the community from the outset, had we been ready, in the much too simple phrase, to surrender some sovereignty at a much earlier stage. If we had been in from the start, 
as almost everybody now acknowledges, we should have had more, not less influence, over the Europe in which we live today. We should never forget the lesson of that isolation, of being on the outside looking in for the conduct of today's affairs. We have done best when we've seen the community, not as a static entity to be resisted and contained, but as an active process which we can shape, often decisively, provided we allow ourselves to be fully engaged in it, with confidence, with enthusiasm, and in good faith. We must at all costs avoid presenting ourselves yet again with an oversimplified choice, a false antithesis, a bogus dilemma between one alternative, starkly labelled cooperation between independent sovereign states, and a second, equally crudely labelled alternative, centralised federal superstate, as if there were no middle way in between. We commit a serious error if we think always in terms of surrendering sovereignty and seek to stand pat for all time on a given deal by proclaiming, as my right honourable friend the Prime Minister did two weeks ago, that we have surrendered enough. The European enterprise is not and should not be seen like that, as some kind of zero-sum game. So Winston Churchill, Churchill put it much more positively 40 years ago, and he said, is it not possible and not less agreeable to regard this sacrifice or merger of national sovereignty as the gradual assumption by all the nations concerned of that larger sovereignty which can alone protect their diverse and distinctive customs and characteristics and their national traditions. I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that I find Winston Churchill's perception a good deal more convincing and more encouraging for the interest of our nation than the nightmare image sometimes conjured up by my right honourable friend, who seems, who seems sometimes to look out upon a continent that is positively teeming with ill-intentioned people scheming, in her words, to extinguish democracy, to dissolve our national identities, to lead us through the back door into a federal Europe. What kind of vision is that, Mr. Speaker, for our business people who trade there each day, for our financiers who seek to make London the money capital of Europe, or for all the young people of today? These concerns are especially important as we approach the crucial topic of economic and monetary union. We must be positively and centrally involved in this debate and not fearfully and negatively detached. The costs of disengagement here could be very serious indeed. There's talk, of course, of the emergence of a single currency for Europe. I agree that there are many difficulties about the concept, both economic and political. And of course, as I said in my own letter of resignation, none of us wants the imposition of a single currency. But that isn't the real risk. The 11 others cannot impose their solution on the 12th country against its will, but they can go ahead without us. The risk is not imposition, but isolation. The real threat is of leaving ourselves with no say in the monetary arrangements that the rest of Europe chooses for itself, with Britain once again scrambling to join the club later, after the rules have been set and after the power has been distributed by others to our disadvantage. That would be the worst possible outcome. It is to avoid just that outcome, to find a compromise both acceptable in the government and sellable in Europe, that my right honourable friend the Chancellor has put forward his hard AQ proposal. This lays careful emphasis on the possibility that the hard AQ as a common currency could, given time, evolve into a single currency. I have, of course, supported the hard AQ plan. But after Rome, and after my right honourable friend's comments two weeks ago, there is grave danger that the hard AQ is becoming untenable. For two things have happened. The first was that my right honourable friend has appeared to rule out from the start any compromise at any stage on any of the basic components which all the 11 other countries believe to be a part of the MU. A single currency or a permanently fixed exchange rate. A central bank or common monetary policy, asked if we would veto any arrangement which jeopardised the pound sterling. My right honourable friend replied simply, yes. That statement means not that we can block EMU, but that they can go ahead without us. Is that a position that is likely to ensure 
as I put it in my resignation letter, that we hold and retain a position of influence in this vital debate. I fear not. Rather, to do so, we must, as I said, take care not to rule in or rule out any one solution absolutely. We must be seen to be part of the same negotiation. The second thing that happened was, I fear, even more disturbing. Reporting to this House, my right honourable friend almost casually remarked that she didn't think many people would want to use the hard AQ anyway, even as a common currency, let alone as a single one. It was remarkable, indeed it was tragic, to hear my right honourable friend dismissing with such personalised incredulity the very idea that the hard AQ proposal might find growing favour among the peoples of Europe. Just as it was extraordinary to hear her assert that the whole idea of EMU might be open for consideration only by future generations. Mr Speaker, those future generations are with us today. How on earth are the Chancellor and the Governor of the Bank of England commending the hard AQ as they strive to do, to be taken as serious participants in the debate against that kind of background noise? Mr Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker I believe that both the Chancellor and the Governor are cricketing enthusiasts. So I hope there's no monopoly of cricketing metaphors. It's rather like sending your opening batsman to the crease, only for them to find, the moment the first balls are bowled, that their bats have been broken before the game by the team captain. Order. The point, the point, Mr. Speaker, was perhaps more sharply put by a British businessman trading in Brussels and elsewhere who wrote to me last week. People throughout Europe, he said, see our Prime Minister's finger wagging and hear her passionate, no, 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 much more clearly than the content of the carefully worded formal texts. It is too easy, he went on, for them to believe that we all share her attitudes. For why else, he asked, has she been our Prime Minister for so long? <coughs> this is, my correspondent concluded, a desperately serious situation for our country. And sadly, Mr Speaker, I have to agree. The tragedy is, and it is for me personally, for my party, for our whole people, and for my right honourable friend herself, a very real tragedy, that the Prime Minister's perceived attitude towards Europe is running increasingly serious risks for the future of our nation. It risks minimising our influence and maximising our chances of being once again shut out. We've paid heavily in the past for late starts and squandered opportunities in Europe. We dare not let that happen again. If we detach ourselves completely, as a party or as a nation, from the middle ground of Europe, the effects will be incalculable and very hard ever to correct. Mr Speaker, in my letter of resignation, which I tended with the utmost sadness and dismay, I said that cabinet government is all about trying to persuade one another from within. That was my commitment to government by persuasion, persuading colleagues and the nation. I've tried to do that as Foreign Secretary and since. But I realise now that the task has become futile of trying to stretch the meaning of words beyond what is credible of trying to pretend there was a common policy when every step forward risked being subverted by some casual comment or impulsive answer. The conflict of loyalty, of loyalty to my right honourable friend the Prime Minister, and after more than two decades together, that instinct of loyalty is still very real, and of loyalty to what I perceive to be the true interest of this nation, that conflict of loyalty has become all too great. I no longer believe it possible to resolve that conflict from within this government. That is why I have resigned. In doing so, I have done what I believe to be right for my party and my country. The time has come for others to consider their own response to the tragic conflict of loyalties with which I have myself wrestled for perhaps too long. Yeah.